Welcome back to this video lecture series for ethics. In this video, we will continue our discussion of the utilitarianism of John Stuart Mill. And before we dive into the specific topic of this video, let's recap a few of the points we've made about utilitarianism thus far. So you'll remember that utilitarianism is a moral theory or a theory of right action, which holds the following. It says the ethically correct action is whatever produces the greatest happiness for the greatest number. So for the utilitarians like Mill, like Bentham, what morality, what ethics fundamentally is about is about producing as much happiness, as much pleasure as you can into the world with your actions. And to that extent, it very much seems like a very optimistic sort of cheery moral theory. Now, the basic statement of utilitarianism is relatively straightforward, but we've seen it has various components that we've been explaining thus far. So you, you will recall that we said that utilitarians are consequentialists. They think that when evaluating an action, the only thing that matters is the consequence, the result, or the outcome of that action. The intention with which you, with which you act, your motive, how the action made you feel on the inside, what you had in your heart, none of those things matter from a moral point of view for determining whether the action itself is good or bad. If you're a consequentialist, all that matters is the outcome or the consequence. We won't spend too much time on that specific point this week, but next week we'll, we will be diving into consequential, in consequentialism in some detail and discussing it in tandem with the issue of euthanasia. We also discussed in some previous videos Mill's hedonism. This idea that what makes a human life go well, what constitutes our happiness, is pleasure and the absence of pain. And the reason this matters for a utilitarian is you say, okay, well, if what determines the rightness or wrongness of my actions is the consequences, now I know what makes a consequence good. A good consequence is one that produces pleasure and happiness. A bad consequence is one that produces pain. But still at this point, you might be left with a further question. Okay, let's say you accept consequentialism and you accept hedonism, you say what I'm supposed to do with my actions is produce as much happiness as I can into the world. Well, happiness for whom? Happiness for yourself? Happiness for your friends and your family? Maybe the people in your city, your state, your country? Human beings? All sentient beings? Whose happiness am I supposed to concern myself with? And in this video, we're going to look at how utilitarians and how Mill answers that question. And they answer it with what we'll call the principle of equality. And there are a couple passages from utilitarianism where Mill explains his view on the principle of equality and how it relates to utilitarianism. So Mill tells us the standard of utilitarianism is not the agent's own greatest happiness, but the greatest amount of happiness altogether. So at first glance, you might say, well, if morality is just about happiness, does that mean just making myself as happy as possible? Is this just some sort of ethical egoism where the only thing that matters is what's good for me? And the answer to that question is decidedly no. Right, so when utilitarians talk about happiness and producing it, they mean happiness for every conceivable individual that could be influenced by your action. That means the happiness of yourself, yes. Also your friends and family, yes. The people in your city, state, and country, yes. People you've never met, sure. Um, people, perhaps, if they exist on other planets who could somehow be affected by your, your actions, sure. What about individuals of different species? What about non-human animals? Well, at this point, let's look at a second passage where Mill states the following. To the greatest extent possible, we should secure to all mankind, and not to them only, but so far as the nature of things admits to the whole sentient creation. So should we be concerned with all human beings when we act? Yes, we should. But we should also be concerned with any being that can feel pleasure in pain, any sentient creature, as Mill says here. And this makes sense, right? If, if you're a hedonist, if you think that what makes a life go well is the presence of pleasure and absence of pain, then of course, as we've discussed, human beings aren't the only animals that can feel those sensations. Many other animals can as well. So what we see with the principle of equality is this idea that we have to take into account the happiness of every single individual that can be influenced by our actions, whether we know them or don't, whether they live near us or far from us, or whether they're even the same species as us. 
And we can encapsulate what the principle of equality says more formally and as the following. When we make a moral decision, one must, one, take into consideration every being whose interests can be influenced by that decision and consider the interests of every such being equally. So you have to think about everyone who can be affected by your action and also say that all those individuals have equal importance. So the fact that someone is near you doesn't give that person any more importance um, in terms of your action. The fact that you know someone doesn't give them any more importance. The fact that someone is a member of your own species or your own family or your own religion or political party, none of that matters. You must treat all individuals equally when thinking about how to act and thinking to, about how to live a moral and ethical life. And I think this is one point at which I, there's something I really want to emphasize um, a number of times when it comes to utilitarianism. Utilitarianism on its face is a very sort of straightforward doctrine to understand. The right action is just the action that produces greatest happiness for the greatest number of people. But despite its straightforward appearance, it actually can have some rather radical consequences. And it has this in a number of ways, but just think about the following. On a normal day-to-day -day basis, whose interests do you um, prioritize? Well, I would imagine you prioritize your own interests. I would imagine that you prioritize the interests of your family and your friends and the people who you know, maybe the people in your community. Although on a normal day-to-day -day basis, we probably don't even think very widely on the neighborhood level. We're mostly focused on what do I have to do, um, what are my tasks I have to do, what do I have to do for myself today and my family, right? On a, if we're just honest with ourselves on a day-to-day -day basis, a normal, um, the way we normally live our lives, our moral scope, the, our moral way of thinking doesn't extend very beyond the, uh, far beyond the walls of our home. And so if we do, the thing to notice is that if we do accept the principle of equality, it may in fact have some rather radical and rather drastic effects on the way we're supposed to act. And in fact, we're going to see that with the lessons we're going to discuss um, dealing with the principle of equality. Now, a very common reaction to thinking about the role that the principle of equality plays in utilitarianism is that this seems to demand a lot of sacrifice on my part. Um, you know, if I have to think about the interests of humanity as a whole, of strangers I've never met, of people that have no real relation to me, where's the time for my own projects, my own interests, my own needs? And if, as we said before, if Aristotle, for instance, is correct, if Aquinas is correct, if ethics and morality, if living a good life is actually supposed to contribute to our happiness, to make us flourish, then we might say, well, utilitarian morality, at first it sounds like it's all about happiness, but now it just sounds like all about demand, obligation, and sacrificing myself. If I don't benefit in any way from being a good person, why should I buy into this whole arrangement? This is a question Mill is actually quite concerned with, because he doesn't deny that utilitarianism does demand some self-sacrifice, but ultimately, he, he sort of wishes it didn't demand self-sacrifice in that way, and I'll explain what that means in a minute. But ultimately thinks, once we really understand the nature of altruism, once we understand the nature of helping others, he doesn't think we should really see it as a self-sacrifice at all. So to see what I mean, let's take a look at this passage. Mill says, it's only in a very imperfect state of the world's arrangements that anyone can best serve the happiness of others by the absolute sacrifice of his own. So what does he mean here? He says, well, the only reason we see helping others, doing what's good for others, as a sacrifice to our own happiness is because we live in a very imperfect world. And in fact, Mill says it's the world itself is arranged in a very imperfect way. Now, that can mean a number of things. It might mean the social and political arrangements are such that we just see our own happiness in a zero-sum game with the happiness of others. That is, we're conditioned by society to think that only in a competitive way, such that if someone else gains, we are losing. To think in a very egoistic and self-centered fashion. I think to some extent that 
is probably what Mill has in mind. He was very much concerned with how can we structure society so as to make it easier for us to consider the happiness of all mankind. But it can also just be some facts about human nature. It could be some facts coming from our evolutionary past that make it very difficult for us to think about beyond our own interests, beyond the interests of our in-group. So in any case, he thinks it's an unfortunate fact that given the imperfect state the world is in, whether from nature or nurture, that we do see um, helping others and the happiness of others as coming to a sacrifice of ourself. But he thinks that if we truly adopt a way of living, a manner of living, in which we concern ourselves with the happiness of all mankind, he thinks we can actually realize it gives us a higher happiness that we can't obtain just through our selfish and egoistic pursuits. To put it in language we used previously, we saw that Mill thinks the moral sentiments are a higher pleasure, and I think in his view, Acting in a non-selfish, altruistic way so as to benefit others is a higher pleasure. It's a sort of higher pleasure that gives human life meaning. And so he tells us, the conscious ability to do without happiness gives the prospect of realizing such happiness as is obtainable. He's saying, the ability you have to put aside your own needs, your own desires, your own wants, and think about others Although in the moment it seems like you're sacrificing your happiness, actually gives you the opportunity to have a higher sort of happiness, which the person who's completely selfish will never fully be able to understand. And he even talks about the sort of freeing effects it can have, and again, compares the utilitarian doctrine to the doctrine of the Stoics. He says, nothing except that consciousness of, of doing, being able to do without happiness can raise a person above the chances of life. It can free him from excess of anxiety concerning the evils of life and enables him, like many a Stoic in the worst times of the Roman Empire, to cultivate in tr tranquility the sources of satisfaction accessible to him. Think about what the cause is of the things that cause you anxiety, the things that cause you to worry, the things that cause you the sort of mental disturbance that the Stoics were very keen to have us avoid. Well, usually it is, I want this, I need this, I have this project I'm trying to achieve. And what gives you anxiety is the possibility that you don't achieve that goal, that that project doesn't come to fruition, that you don't get what you want. In a sense, it's sort of this tragic situation where the more we focus on what we need and what we want, the more we live this sort of self-centered life, the more anxious we actually become, the farther away we get from happiness, the more we are disturbed. So one thing Mill says here is, if you can take a wider view of things, if you can abstract away from just your own desires, your own needs, your own wants, and actually see yourself as a member of humankind as a whole, See yourself as a member of the collective um, set of beings who can feel pleasure and pain and want to make their lives as good as possible. Then you can stop worrying so much about your individual selfish egoistic needs and take a wider view in which you seek to help others. So this really is the ethos of the utilitarian moral theory, taking a wide standpoint where we say, I want to produce as much happiness for the most number of individuals as I possibly can. Now, in our own times, in, con um, in contemporary philosophy and contemporary moral thought, one group of individuals I would point to as sort of the heirs of this utilitarian um, ethos, or the heirs of this utilitarian idea or movement, is those individuals in, in what is known as the effective altruism uh, movement. Now, if you've been following along, you might have picked up that, well, you know, if we're really supposed to concern ourselves with helping other people, which produ with producing as much happiness as we possibly can in the world, that's probably going to have an effect on, for instance, the ethics of charitable giving. And in fact, in our next video, we're going to look more specifically at that issue. What obligation do we have to use our resources, our time, our energy, uh, most importantly our money, to help those who are in need, to reduce suffering and increase pleasure? So it's very much the case that this utilitarian morality is very much connected and brings up questions about charitable giving. And what the effect of altruism does, it's real, and really is an heir to the utilitarian movement, 
is it says we should think about charitable giving in a specific way. So let's just first break down this phrase, effective altruism. What does it mean? Well, on the one hand, it's altruistic. And what altruism me just means is doing something for the sake of another person, right? You're just saying, I'm going to do this because I want this other person to do well. You're motivated by the well-being of other people. And being altruistic is a good thing. And pretty much anyone, no matter what moral theory or moral tradition or moral ideas you have, you're going to agree to that to some extent it is good to help other people. But perhaps the more controversial, more innovative part of the effective altruism movement is the effective aspect. Because remember, utilitarians are very much focused on what are the consequences of our actions. And we can only know what the consequences of our actions are if we have hard data, if we have good evidence, scientific evidence, that's going to tell us what the consequences of our actions are. And so the effective, al the effective aspect of effective altruism says that the way you should give is the following. In an empirically researched and data-driven way that shows you how each dollar you could spend can do the most good. And I think one way to get at this is to think about, suppose there's someone who's decided they want to engage in charitable giving. How does that person often make the decision of what charity they will donate to? Well, oftentimes it might be, well, I went through this experience, let's say this person had cancer or some other disease, or a family member did, and, you know, so for that reason they're going to donate to that cause. Maybe it's just a cause that for whatever reason pulls at their heartstrings, it's just personally important to them. Maybe it's just a cause that at the moment is in the news, right? So when a natural disaster happens, a hurricane or an earthquake, and many people are suffering, there are tons of donations to that cause, despite the fact that, of course, people are suffering and dying and in need of food and medical supplies and shelter all the time. So one of the things the effective altruist says, good, you have the motivation to want to help others. Now let's harness that into a more effective data-driven way. And instead of just using our heart to decide what charity we should give to, why don't we also use our heads? Why don't we use our critical thinking abilities to think about what charities will be the most effective? And websites such as GiveWell.org will go through and they've compiled, here are the most effective charities that you can give to where you get the most benefit per dollar. And they ask questions like the following when doing these evaluations. How many people specifically are going to benefit from my do donation and how much? What's the most effective thing I can do? Is this an, a neglected area, right? It might be an area that is very important, that's helping a lot of people, but if it's already flooded with donations, it may not need very much more support. What would have happened if I had not donated to this charity, right? What would happen if I gave my money elsewhere? What would success mean? Like, what is the metric for determining success in this org organization, and how likely is that success? Notice these are all the sorts of questions that we don't often associate with charity. We often see it as a very sort of thing that's driven by the heart, driven by altruistic motivations, by warm and tender feelings. But these are the sort of questions you ask when you buy a car or you make any other big purchase, like a home. And so the effective altruists, drawing on these utilitarian ideas, say, yes, we should want to help as many people as we possibly can. We should want to do, uh, produce as much happiness and prevent as much suffering for humanity and beyond as we possibly can. And we should do so in a data-driven way where we know actually what the consequences of our donation will be. So to this point, we have seen what the principle of equality is, and we've also seen how it might contribute to our happiness by making us a more selfless, less um, self-focused, less egoistic person. The final point I want to make in this video is to say something about the kind of standpoint that the utilitarian philosopher like Mill thinks we should adopt. And I want to look at the following passage from utilitarianism, where he, he says the following. I must again repeat what the assailants of utilitarianism seldom have the justice to acknowledge. The happiness which forms the utilitarian standard of what is right in conduct is not the agent's own happiness, but that of all concerned. We already saw that, right? So the happiness we should promote is the happiness of everyone. But what's really interesting here is what he says about how, what our mindset should be, what this requires of us when we're thinking about how to act. Mill tells us, as between his own happiness and that of others, Utilitarianism requires him to be a strictly impartial 
as a disinterested and benevolent spectator. Now, it's that sentence that really always jumps out to me every time I read chapter 2 of of utilitarianism. And what jumps out to me is the following. Mill is telling us here that as a good utilitarian moral agent, we should be both impartial and also benevolent. And the reason that just jumps out to me is that those are two terms that don't often go together. So first, let's think about what benevolence is. Benevolence would be a sort of warm and tender care and concern for other people. It's a sort of concern you'd have for a spouse, for a child, for a very close friend, right? Benevolence is, it's not to say that we can't have it for strangers, it's not to say we can't have it for humanity as a whole, but in general, when we think about those who we are most benevolent to, who we have the most sort of tender and caring feelings towards, it's those who are closest to us. And so when I think of benevolence, I think of the kind father or mother, I think of the caring and attentive friend. Now contrast that with impartiality. What does it mean to be impartial? It means you're not invested in the good of any particular person. It means you're sort of there to look at each person as equal and to um, act in a way that is just and fair for all of them. And so here, the real image of impartiality would be something like a referee at a football game or a judge in a courtroom. Right, the referee of the football game is not supposed to be benevolent in the sense of being attached to one of the teams. If the referee is attached or cares or has warm feelings in his heart from one of the teams, then it's very likely he's not going to enforce the rules fairly. If the judge, for instance, has warm and tender feelings toward the defendant um, or some other person involved in the case, it'd be very unlikely that the judge could actually perform their duty appropriately. So what's interesting to me about this is that when we think about impartiality, we often think about someone who's not primarily benevolent. Someone who's not attached to some specific other individual. We think of someone um, treating everyone equally, fairly, justly, impartially, and in a a sort of detached way. So the reason I bring this up is because, in a certain way, impartiality and benevolence don't seem to go that well together. In a certain sense, they seem to be almost opposites. Yet, what Mill is telling us here is that, as a utilitarian moral agent, we should put these things together. And so what does he mean? Well, here's the way I would think about it. So here's you, let's say. And here's the attitude you should have toward everybody else, including yourself, that's in what I'll call the great sea of humanity, which includes all human beings, and really, as we've said, all sentient beings. So on the one hand, you need to take an impartial point of view towards everyone in the sea of humanity. You need to say, are my interests important? Yes. Are the interests of my family and friends? Yes. Of my fellow citizens? Of course. Strangers? Yes. Everyone in the sea of humanity matters, and they matter equally. And so you should abstract away, you should take a sort of third-person point of view, look down and say, when I'm deciding how to act, everybody gets a vote, so to speak. Everyone's interests matter, but no no one's interests are special. And again, it's when we take that impartial, abstracted view, it's when it's most difficult to be benevolent. It's very, it's so much easier to be benevolent to someone right in front of you who you know, or someone you don't even know who, but who's suffering or needs help right in front of you. It's much more difficult to be benevolent toward humanity in the abstract, toward the collective of humanity, toward the collective of all sentient creation. But this is what utilitarianism demands. It demands that we treat all people equally and also that we care about the interests of all those people equally. Or at least we care about them enough to motivate ourselves to act and do what is best for the greatest number. And if you're thinking to yourself, this sounds like a very challenging task, well, it is. And in part, as we said previously, Mill thinks it's made more difficult by the fact that we live in a very imperfect world where he thinks we're sort of conditioned to see other people as competitors with us, to see other people being happy as necessarily a loss to our own happiness, where we have an inability to um, take joy and, and... and feel pleasure in the happiness of other people or anyone else in the sea of humanity. 
So Mill admits that this is not an easy standpoint to adopt, and what, of course, is the remedy? In order to fully have the principle of equality be part of our collective human psychology, be part of our the way in which human beings tend to view the world, he thinks we would need changes to our laws and social arrangements. He says, as the means of making the nearest approach to this ideal, utility would enjoin first that laws and social arrangements should place the happiness, or speaking practically it may be called the interest of every individual, as nearly as possible in harmony with the interest of the whole. And secondly, that education and opinion, which have so vast a power over human character, should so use that power as to establish in the mind of every individual an indissoluble association between his own happiness and the good of the whole. So two things. First, the way we organize society needs to make it such that the happiness of everyone is tied up with the happiness of the group. We need to make it such that we can't have people who profit when others suffer. We need to make it such that we can't have it the case where people can cheat their way to satisfying their own interests and causing others to lose. And so it would be a longer discussion to go into detail on what that looks like, but suffice it to say, Mill is in favor of perhaps drastic changes to the way societies organize that would make such, um, that would make su- such things impossible. But there's also another component. Notice he mentions education. And I don't think he's just talking about formal education and schooling. I would imagine he's also talking here about the sort of moral education you get from your parents, from your culture, from your religion, from your community. A sort of education which says, it is good when other people are happy. It is good when people even you don't know is happy. It is good when the human society as a whole is experiencing much as much pleasure as possible and feeling as little suffering as possible. To This is what he means by an indissoluble association, an education which makes it the case that you cannot live a flourishing life if you know there are others there who are suffering in ways that are entirely preventable, that your own happiness would be affected and you would be moved to want to change those circumstances. That, in any case, is the sort of tall task, the tall order that would truly be needed for the principle of equality to be followed and really Uh, placed into our, our collective human psychology. So I will stop there. Thank you for listening, and I will see you in the next video.